Hi there, this is Laura Perryman from the Seattle, Washington area, and I'm delighted today to talk to you about chronic dry eye disease. That may seem kind of dry, and there's a heck of a lot of science behind it, but I think if you look at it through an 80s dance party style lens, it becomes pretty darn entertaining. So my goal today is to give you a high-level tour of the science, but uh, have a little fun. I hope your dancing shoes are on, because we're going to boogie. These are my financial disclosures. Outline. All right, so I divided this into five different chunks, and they all have a theme song in my mind. The definition and pathophysiology, our understanding of it has changed. We understand there's a significant neurologic component, so that's You Got a Lot of Nerve. It's an obscure hollow note song from the Voices album, and I'm a huge hollow notes fan, as some of you may know. Number two is the impact of dry disease on patient quality of life and best corrected vision, and that's the private eyes section. Number three, Chronic dry disease is a local regional disease. We, we get so focused in on the eye, but really it's important to expand your view and see it as a local regional disease and often a systemic disease as well. Number four, the vicious circles. That's the, you spin me right round like a record baby. And finally, innovations. I want a new drug. So let's get into it. Dry disease can create some pretty big emotions in our colleagues. For example, your cataract surgery colleagues think uh, they just want to pre up all night and operate every day. Some of them can feel like dry kind of gets in the way and it drives them wild, it drives them crazy. I think dry is a heck of a lot of fun. My friends wonder why I talk about dry all the time. What can I say? And then lastly, one of the reasons why we're here today is to establish the idea that uh, you can have some fun with this. You can master this. You can put a little swagger in your step. So that next dry patient that comes in, just leave it all up to me. So dry disease, the definition of impact of physiology. <laughs> so let's get into it. We all know, and you're going to hear other excellent talks about this, that the definition has changed. In the original 2007 definition, um, Compared to today, you can read that for yourself, but here are the really important things that are different. The new definition that came out in July of 2017, consensus-based panel, this is an epic volume of work with the hands of many excellent, talented physicians and researchers around the world. Dry disease is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis. This thing is supposed to run without our awareness and without damage to the eye. In dry disease, we lose that. It affects the tear film, and it's accompanied by ocular symptoms which, in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiologic roles. Neurosensory, isn't that interesting? Inflammation, yeah, I think that's pretty well accepted. Salty tears, hyperosmolarity, sure. The real new one, the big surprise, is the neurosensory components. So let's explore that. Here is a figure of the lacrimal functional unit and this is a remarkable system because you have these corneal nerves on the surface constantly sensing the quality of the tears and the environment, dust, temperature, uh, evaporative load, etc. and sending signals to the brain. The brain takes that information, integrates it, and sends out command fibers back to the lacrimal functional unit apparatus. Lacrimal gland, I need you to put out some aqueous Mybomian gland cells, I need you to produce more mybum. Yes, the mybomian glands are neurobiologically connected to the central nervous system. That's kind of cool. And then also, the goblet cells are neurosensory, under neurosensory command of the central nervous system to make a complete tear. I think that's kind of a miracle. Pretty amazing. 
here's another picture of the neuroanatomy. Um, think neuroanatomically, think pathways, referred pain, migrainous pain. If anything seems out of the ordinary, go ahead and image them. Look for uh, other situations when you have that non-garden variety dry eye disease. Here's another picture of the brain. And what I want to point out is you have the eyeball way out over here. And look at all this other neurologic real estate that's involved in the processing of sensation on the ocular surface. Not to mention the command fibers that regulate the homeostatic control of the tear film. Pretty remarkable stuff. A couple things to point out. In the context of corneal neuropathic pain, you can have loss of inhibitory fibers from the um, more superior parts in the brain that dampen and control and modulate the incoming pain responses. And when that goes haywire, now you've got essential neuropathic pain. I call that the how of how. So you've got this stimulation on the ocular surface in the dry patient that can't homeostatically control anymore. So that can be in the form of mechanical stress, thermal stress, evaporative stress, and osmolar stress. And these are all subtypes of nociceptors or pain receptors in the corneal subbasal plexus. Those subtypes, mechano, polymodals, and cold nociceptors send a signal to the ganglion neurons. This is where the signal is amplified, sort of like plugging in your electric guitar into your amplifier, turns up the volume. In the case of neuropathic pain patients, that volume is cranked all the way to 11. That's a spinal tap reference. Then what happens is it gets sent to what I call the big black box, that's for central processing, the trigeminal brainstem nuclear complex sends out two commands, one signaling for pain to the other parts of the brain, and the other part is tearing and blinking. And this becomes a very interesting thing to be observant for in your dry patient. That's the first thing I notice when I walk in the room is the patient's blink pattern. That tells me a lot. Yeah, these chronic pain patients uh, really do struggle. <clears throat> okay, here's an example of what I call splint blinking. This is a patient with a history of breast cancer. She has tattoo eyeliner, and oh, her eyes are just so very dry. Watch this blink pattern. This can tell you a lot as soon as you walk in the room. How your day's going? Oh, it's going. You know, I wanted to ask you. I do use Restasis. Mm -hmm. We read something somewhere that there's, or maybe we saw it on TV. There's another eye drop that's um, prescription only. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that any more effective, or is it just basically, you know, the same thing but a new name? Well, that's a fantastic question, and mm -hmm. what I'd like to do is do a thorough examination mm -hmm. and have a look, and uh, then we can talk about its utility for you. Mm -hmm. That poor lady, she really does suffer. Three plus staining, um, her ocular surface is pretty rough. Here's another example of splint beaking. This patient has rheumatoid arthritis, and she just wants her eyes protected from that evaporative stress. She just wants to close them. But, you know, at night it's... You just want to close them? Yes. 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 Does it like, feel better when you blink, right? Feels better when they're closed. Mm -hmm. That tells you a lot when that patient gives you that kind of history. Here's a surprising example of a blink pattern. This is a patient with uh, tearing, and we got her all cleared up. She was doing great. Came back in saying, Dr. Perriman, I've had tearing for the last couple weeks. And I'm looking at her blink pattern, and I figure out what the problem is. So I want you to look closely at that outer third of the abicularis muscle. Oh, that's interesting. Couple of hints. This one's a little older. She's beautiful. She does a lot to maintain her beauty. And two weeks prior, she had had Botox injected to the crow's feet area. Absolutely takes that lateral third of the abicularis function offline and you lose the pump function of the lids and that's why she was having spillover tearing. So look carefully at the patient's blink pattern. It can tell you a lot about pain. It can tell you when it's not working right as well. Lots of clues are, but what does inflammation have to do with any of this? Go, go Tina, she's a sassy girl, I love her. 
this is my grandfather on the ranch in Montana, and he always said, Laura, you can't ride a three-legged horse. And what he means by that is you need a four-stable structure to get to where you need to go. And I love this analogy for understanding the DOES2 diagnostic algorithm. There's four parts to this. There's the, diagno the question triage, ask the questions, do questionnaires. There's risk factor analysis. That's an underappreciated component. Really add up that patient's risk factors. I'm going to show you a cool little wheel resource tool that I use in my exam lane later on in the talk. Then there's our diagnostics. I definitely use osmolarity testing on essentially every dry eye patient. I'll do uh, inflammatory testing on every new patient and until they are negative, and then I'll test them uh, if there's a flare-up in their chronic dry eye disease. And then lastly, you classify and treat your dry eye disease patient. And the big red circle is indicative of that huge component of my and gland dysfunction. Here's a little more explanation of the inflammation component. Mother Nature designed that lacrimal functional unit to maintain perfect homeostatic control no matter how cold it is, no matter how windy it is, no matter what's going on in your environmental world so that you can maintain a stable tear film to survive. When you lose that homeostatic control, inflammation results. You have loss of homeostasis, activation of early inflammatory mediators, secondary inflammatory mediators, and then damage to the ocular surface. And once this thing gets revved up, it is a man-eater situation for the ocular surface. Especially the poor goblet cells. So this is a diagram that I built uh, a couple years ago. I'm a molecular biologist by training. I worked uh, at uh, Immunex before I went to medical school. And so I really like this deep level nerdy molecular biology stuff, but it doesn't have to be difficult to understand. There's four main buckets. Initiation of inflammation, amplification of it, recruitment of effector cells, T cells, and then the damage and self-perpetuation component. And this thing gets going right round, right round like a record. So when you initiate a Inside the cell, you have its activation of all these secondary messengers inside of the cell, which essentially act like you dropped a bomb on me inside the cell, and it puts everything on high alert. This is where uh, you have an early activation of MMP9, ICAM upregulation, then there's recruitment, adhesion, migration, T cell activation, Th1, Th17 cell differentiation. I call those Cheech and Chong, right? Because uh, they're both mischief makers. And then finally, you have all of the effector damage phase. And once you get that, you get more aberrant activation. The stars are where we have uh, peer reviewed evidence of IPL as a modality for addressing the inflammatory burden. Things you see in blue is peer reviewed literature demonstrating effectiveness at that point in the inflammatory never ending story. For cyclosporin, and where you see purple is the peer reviewed literature on what we have for lithograss. And I suspect the purple areas will increase as we gain more secondary research knowledge on our new molecule. Okay, the point is inflammation can rub you raw. It can, once you get activation of the T cells and inflammation, you can actually get these secondary nerve abnormalities. And we're going to explore that molecular biology next. And that has impacts on the lacrimal functional unit, as we just talked about. Let's explore that a little bit more. If you ignore all this before you send your patient for cataract surgery, your high performance dreams are going to get jacked up. Here's a molecular biology, this amazing paper that came out in March of 2017. What they found was that IL-1 and TNF, those early phase inflammatory mediators that I showed you in that four phase uh, inflammatory story chart, they upregulate nerve growth factor. Well, that's good if you have an acute injury or an acute infection and you need to repair the damage. That's how the system is designed. The problem with chronic dry eye disease and neuropathy pain, but that's a digression, dry eye disease, is that when it is chronically turned on, you have this high affinity nerve growth factor receptor activity, which is this dysmorphic stimulus on the subbasal plexus. These, ves these, excuse me, these nerves are, you'll have to take my word for it because it takes a trained eye, this is confocal imaging, those are thick, they're beaded, 
they're uh, tortuous and they're in high density. That's in response to this chronic damage to the ocular surface. The body's trying to heal, it just can't. It needs your help. The low affinity receptor is the epithelial cell apoptosis. And on the left, number A, we show um, this loss of epithelial cell density. And that's your fence that keeps uh, the wolves at bay, right? The damage to the epithelial cells creates then opportunities for other things to get through there and activate the dendritic cells. The slide on the right is after...